introductions for our two guests up front here today. First on my left is Josh Weiland. Josh probably is very familiar to you all. He was serving on the AWB board until eight days ago when he joined the commissioner's staff. So Josh, welcome back in a new and different role. Uh, let me turn it over to Commissioner Franz. She's tight on time time today. Uh, elected as the 14th Commissioner of Public Lands for our state in November of 2016, a third generation farmer and a small forest landowner herself. She was also here, what, what two, 10 days ago for our Rural Small Job Summit that we had. 70 different leaders from across the state here for a day on a Saturday to talk about the challenges that are facing rural economies throughout the state of Washington. You came, you stayed, you engaged. So we're glad to have you here today and we'll turn it over to you. Thank you. Thanks so much. Yeah, Thank you. Thank you for having me. I have to say, you guys are sitting so far back, you did not get the memo from the Cattlemen's Association that no, I do not have two heads and breathe fire. So you just so you know, next time you can move forward more. And Art will vouch for that, right Art? Yeah. Uh, so it's great actually be here and it's also nice that there are so many faces that have become familiar over the last year for me. And um, I'm excited to be here. Uh, you know, it, it is true, I'm a third generation Washington state farmer, cattle farmer. Uh, we still have some of that farm in uh, the family today and also a small forest landowner. We have some of the last ponderosa pines west of the Cascades on my family farm. Uh, some of you may know I was raised by my father and grandparents with a very deep close connection to the land and also very much a close connection to community and economic opportunity. My grandparents came to this state uh, leaving the South Dakota in the midst of the Great Depression. And the family farm that my grandfather was raised on had gone under. And they were blessed to be able to pack up my dad and move west and land in Pierce County, which uh, is some of the most beautiful farmland and forest land still to this day. Yes. Um, it's also kind of exciting because my grandfather uh, actually was the first to go to college and he was blessed to get a job at, in, uh, at a pharmacy, one of those old fashioned drug stores. Uh, but it also was going under in the Great Depression. And he said to the owner, look, you're going in the red, you don't have much upside here, but if I can turn it around in one year, will you give it to me outright? And he did. He turned that business around in one year, and the next thing he did, every time he made money, he saved that money to either buy farmland or he'd buy the business right next door, and the business right next door, and the business. So my grandfather, many of you already know, is very much connected as a farmer, and he was connected in forestry, but he also was very much a small business owner. And I was raised with a lot of discipline and some significant values that my grandfather taught me that I'm finding is very, very hard to teach to my three boys, even though I raised them on a farm. But in the era of Twitter, Snapchat, and Instagram, and everything else, uh, it is, can be very hard for us to teach the values that my grandfather taught me, which is hard work, responsibility, toughness to adversity, and giving back to our communities. Uh, these are the values that I believe built this state. These are the values that I, I believe are built on a long-standing belief that when you get hit by hardship, you get up, you work harder, you take responsibility, you help your neighbor, and everything will actually work out. I think as we look around our state and actually nationally, when we look at the landscape, I think that the problem we see, the problem of our lifetime, is that in many parts of our state and many parts of this nation, this belief is getting harder and harder to prove. The fact is that in many of our rural communities, communities that were places of rich natural resources that people and my grandparents, and even before my grandparents came here, that people flocked to, right? Because that was the economic opportunity of our state. Um, that the people who live there feel less and less hope in the belief that hard work actually brings opportunity. It used to be that these people would flock to these places, and I think more and more those who live in these communities know that it's hard for them to even hold on to their youth because their youth are fleeing to look for better jobs and opportunity. And we also see a context where so many generations now have been stuck in the same place of poverty, year, generation after generation, that they can't look back at a time period where they can say, no, it was good, it really was good, and I can promise you it will get better again. So this is, I think, I, our t opportunity. It is our biggest test. It's not one that just Washington State faces, but our nation faces it. It's actually what excites me about my new role. Um, 
I think uh, Department of Natural Resources, and I say this to the governor, uh, Department of Natural Resources because we manage and care for six million acres of land, aquatic, agriculture, and forest, and we regulate over eight million acres of timber land, has a huge opportunity to actually drive growth in our struggling rural communities. And because if you look at the map of our lands that we manage, we are in almost every single community and most of the communities we are in are truly rural communities that depend on those, our natural resources to actually grow their economy. We saw with one million acres of agriculture land that we manage that when we invest in infrastructure investment like water pipes and roads and other opportunities, we actually grow greater revenue off those agricultural lands. And as Charlie nods, we know that goes to schools and we know that those goes to counties to help their roads and also human services and economic opportunities in those communities. We know with two million acres of forest land that we have a huge opportunity for actually ensuring growth of the economy for timber, but we also know that one of our greatest threats to our forest economy, which is the 2.7 million acres of forest that we have in the state, which is state, federal, and tribal land, is in poor health. And I always look at when we got a problem, it's actually how do you flip it the other way and make it an opportunity. Those 2.7 million acres of land are a huge opportunity for us to look at those communities where mill infrastructure has been lost, where jobs have disappeared. How do we start to remove and act the forest debris that we have, do the selective thinning, actively manage those forests, and actually start to grow the economy. And last Friday, I am even more excited after the historic agreement we signed with the Forest Service, which now enables the Department of Natural Resources not only to start actively managing our own forest land in those places, but also to get be able to cross over the boundaries and get on federal land and actively manage those forest land so that we can actually increase jobs, grow the local economy, reduce the fuel load that creates this catastrophic wildfires, which we know just makes their economy even more challenged as we go forward. We also have 2.5 million acres of aquatic land. Uh, much of our state is blessed with some of the most amazing shellfish beds. We have a huge opportunity for trying to remove, sort of a, reduce the kinds of regulations that stand. I mean, 34 boxes to get a shellfish permit. And much of the challenge that we are facing with small growers is they can't even enter the market because by the time they get their first permit, they've already gone broke. Um, we also have an opportunity as I look to you when we look at our recreation opportunity on our aquatic lands, right? for our marinas and our boating community. And as we know, our ports are absolutely critical for the movement of our product off of our shores to other communities across the nation and internationally. So I look at this and go, the greatest thing about being the commissioner of public lands and managing all this land, and no offense to the legislature and the governor, but I don't necessarily have to go over there to be able to get, as my desk plate says, epic shit done. And anybody, and it says, we, as we went around and the number of lobbyists, you know, year after year, great ideas, enter the halls and they get lost or they take many, many years to get done. What I'm hoping to do is start to leverage the lands that we have and the communities that we um, have in this state that are so eager for opportunity to be able to start to get things done that don't necessarily have to wait for budgets or wait for legislation. So the first step of that was a new position that I created at the Department of Natural Resources, which is our new community development director, Josh Weiland. Um, and the role of, of Josh in this position is to actually be looking at our state, looking where we have a significant number of public lands and communities and communities that are struggling and have been challenged economically and be able to start to work locally at the ground level in about five communities. We're going to start with five because if we try to do every community, you know what's going to happen. We're not going to be successful at all. To look at five communities and begin to actually develop partnerships with local government, federal government, chamber of commerce, economic development districts, the private sector and say, we have these lands within this community agricultural lands, forest lands, aquatic lands. What are the opportunities that we have with those lands? 
One of the first things we're going to do is an asset management analysis of the lands. The last time we actually did one was 20 years ago. Okay, and anybody who owns real estate, you like to know what you have, what its best function and value is, what its opportunity is, how is the world around those places changed, what has been built up, what infrastructure has been lost, um, and then identify the function and value of those lands, look around at the community, and have the conversations with the community to say, what are the infrastructure investments that we have in this community that help us actually generate greater revenue off those lands as well as other working farmlands, working forest lands, or aquatic lands? What are the kinds of infrastructure investments that we need that we don't have? And how can DNR, through our role, either working with the legislature to get budget opportunities, writing grants to the federal government, or being an incubator, try to get those infrastructure investments into that community, and then also help work to develop a diverse economic plan for those communities. As we know, any community that's based on one sector is going to always be challenged because markets ebb and flow. And so the more we can be looking at our lands and say we have opportunity for ag, forestry, and recreation, for example, in Kittitas County, or we have opportunities on our coast for aquaculture, timber, and recreation, or we have opportunities on the eastern part of our state for timber, ag, and clean energy and begin to actually diversify those economic base, have Department of Natural Resources own public lands be part of that solution, not the only solution, and be a clear partner at the table building those plans with them and then implementing. That's my goal. That's I'm super excited to have Josh, who has a longstanding connection with AWB and many of you, to be leading this effort up. We are blessed at DNR not only to have public lands, but we got economists, we got transactions, we got appraisers, we've got geologists, we've got people who've been working in forestry and agriculture who have that expertise too that can help be brought to the table to develop those plans for that community. And so I'm super excited. This is one of my key top priorities of my uh, role in the next four years. And I'm looking forward to working with each and every one of you to get it started and make progress. So thank you. So I always like to move to questions and answers. As most of my team would tell you, I'm better with questions and answers and conversation. I don't like the one way thing. So um, five communities are you targeting? So, very good question, and the hardest part about five communities and targeting is you have winners and losers, right? So, this is a, this, we haven't yet fully, you know, developed the idea of how we go and identify those five communities. We are going to be looking at geographic dispersion, right, obviously. We're also going to be looking at opportunities that have different types of economic base, right? Like I, ex I use the example of the coast, right? So, the coast is going to have aquaculture and recreation and timber very different econ natural resource economic base than you might find in the central part of our state or the most eastern part of our state. So we're going to be looking at having geographical distribution as well as one that enables us to use, sort of bring in different kinds of economies and grow and test and prove. Okay. You guys are shy. I had no idea. When you said clean energy, are you suggesting maybe some solar or wind on some of the blocks of land that you guys own? Yeah, so we actually have some wind on our land, and actually when we put wind on our land, we move from sometimes a dollar an acre to $1,200 to $1,400 an acre, which is a huge, huge revenue. Not only, that doesn't even like take into consideration the jobs factor, right, of operations, maintenance, and construction and development. Um, obviously, the ability to do clean energy is challenging in many places of our state, not only because you've got to have the transmission lines and the grid and you've got to have the population centers, but you also got to make sure the wind's blowing at the right time and to make it um, uh, pencil out. We're going to be looking at every, we're going to look at wind, we're going to be looking at solar, we're going to be looking at biomass as well. We're also, I mean, we've got even some conversations that we've been hearing about, about different opportunities for sort of creating their our own hydro facility and I have no idea if it's actually going to work but you know clean energy and tech energy technology is like vastly moving at an unbelievable pace and scale um, there's some new stuff happening actually on the Columbia River that I'm sort of excited to learn more about but um, so we're open and I know I think I spoke with you and about an opportunity on potential energy regarding transportation fuel right yeah so so as you vet the five communities, should we be twisting your arm, Josh's arm, 
uh, accepting nominees. <laughs> yes. <laughs> like that. So I would say twist both of our arms, you know. Um, so I would say come with ideas. We're going to be looking ideally for a place to kind some thoughts. One, I don't want to have five communities that it's going to take a lot for us to get all five really moving. We're going to want some that early, you know, low hanging fruit, right? Or maybe there's already a table that's been created. I can think about like Kittitas, for example, where there's been a long conversation about the, you know, active management of the forest lands with state and federal lands there and the context of no mill infrastructure and already a table that's been formed, right? And obviously recreation is a huge, huge growing opportunity there. That may be a more low hanging fruit that enables us, it's already a few paces down uh, that, so we, because we want some wins that enable us to be able to show those that are harder because they've been in such a rut for it much longer and getting those kinds of investments is going to take a lot more effort and time and work. We don't want people to feel like it's a failure before we even give it a chance. So, yeah, but I would, and I, I'll also what I'd love is some things where we're like, wow, this has never been done before, or there's a new technology that Washington State could be leading in. Why don't we look at those opportunities and making it happen? So there's, it's open right now, but obviously we'll want to have a pretty good uh, number amount of acres of our public lands there, because that's what we bring to the table, right? Yes. So Kathleen Collins, one of, one of my clients is a, a group that works on water run issues. And obviously for people to uh, thrive and work in the world economies that you're talking about, you need to more conveniently live there. And I know you've heard about the Hearst decision. Yes. Um, <laughs> Just so you know, I did not create the Hearst problem. I want to make that for the record. I walked into that. So, well, that's an important. I don't. I just mean that it's important for everybody to know that. I tried to settle it and try to get resolved because courts sometimes can not be the best places to get these solutions. Um, so, one of the challenges we're having is finding uh, a reasonable solution that allows uh, someone who wants to just build a house, start a small business out in the rural area to be able to access uh, water with via an exempt permit. And um, I'll just offer a suggestion that since you do have some context around this, that any any voice you can lend to that in the context of your community development effort would be helpful to get people to understand, legislators, that people want to, not, not only do they want to live out in the rural areas, but they need to live out in the rural areas to make the economies work. So I, I'll just put that out there for you to think about. Yeah. It would be no, so I appreciate it. Um, so again, I'm maybe one positive part of being in this role is I don't have to administer a water rights issue. And I, uh, all those who have worked within the water issue of Washington State can understand it's a pretty challenging, complicated, and it's, I think it's only going to get even more challenging as our population grows. But we also see the kinds of droughts we've seen over the past couple of you know, years or decade. Um, I will say that I think, you know, and this is just me as an average citizen actually speaking and with maybe some experience in water issues um, and not as the Commissioner of Public Lands, that probably one of the best things that can happen is I believe local communities are best at identifying and understanding what their problem is and developing the solution, okay? And the Kittitas water plan that I helped uh, work on with the county commissioners is a perfect example where you have enormous amount of users, right? You got ag, you got tribes, you got fish and wildlife needs, you got population growing at an unbelievable pace. And as soon as that pass gets, you know, the, the road gets completely finished there, it's only going to grow even more because it's going to become sort of a bedroom community to the east part of King County. That community was struggling with significant amount of drought issues for a long, long time. But by bringing all those stakeholders together and developing a pretty innovative water solution, they have now tackled their water problem and have a solution that's in place. You know, Yakima Integration Plan is another example where communities come together to solve that problem. Every watershed is so different and the needs of that community are so different that ideally what we would have in my mind, okay, this is just my personal, uh, sense of is communities developing their water plan, right? That is really, especially those that have been really struggling, and then having that be based on 
the broad group of stakeholders in that community coming and developing the solution that ensures long-term success of water resources without the fear of drought or the or being able to address drought when it happens, right? Um, because they have a solution in place. Well, and I don't disagree with anything you said. And we have mechanisms in place to do a lot of that. So maybe what I can do is set up some time and we can talk kind of more in depth about what this particular um, little niche of a problem is. And it's, it's a niche that's creating a, a lot of uh, consternation amongst people who've been uh, suddenly quite displaced and disadvantaged. And, what I will say for so back to Department of Natural Resources is what I will say is that one of the things we've been doing is we've been sitting on enormous amount of water rights right that we weren't even aware of that fortunately through we have an unbelievable uh, person at the agency who has long-standing expertise in water issues um, has actually been working to make sure we are uh, putting the infrastructure investments in to be able to procure and ensure that we hold on to those water rights as we know how water law works in the state. The great thing about that is when we've done that, we have actually just last year increased our ag production and the revenue off it by 50%, right? I mean, unbelievable. And so we're going to be continuing to be thinking progressively in that way of where, what are the water rights we already have? Are we actually leveraging those water rights? How do we make sure we're getting the infrastructure investment in? And that obviously creates more opportunities specifically for agriculture where we have land that we've been leasing that we're now able to actually expand the value and use of that land even further. Yeah. Yes. Thanks for mentioning the outdoor recreation economy. Um, what's been your biggest surprise since you've taken office? I would tell you the biggest, so, you know, when I was, well, two, actually. Um, first, I'll just say it's internal. When I was running, you know, a lot of people said, oh, my gosh, this is a huge bureaucracy that is an old boys network where people have lived there for 40 years innovation and creativity is not welcome right and i'm just you know and everybody's like get ready all your you know do epic shit that's gonna be really hard right <laughs> when people are just used to one way and they don't like change and i'll just tell you i mean i've been around the state almost i've uh, gone into almost every region i think but i have one left to go to um, and uh, been at all the all hands meetings in each region um, to meet all the staff and then also within the Olympia office. And time and time again, the people are just begging, please, can we bring creative, innovative solutions to you? We've had these long standing problems where we want to be able to bring something forward that may be not traditional or maybe a little risky, right? Are you open to it? And I said, I hate standing still. So if you're moving the ball and you are move, able to start to solve problems, and I, I'm looking at you because I know there's been long standing problems and issues, you know, probably every one of you has worked with Department of Natural Resources. It feels like sometimes progress is slow, right? Um, I heard so many people just say please we are welcoming a quicker pace with decision making a quicker pace with innovation and creativity so i'm really excited about that well you guys can keep you know ask me back in a year and say okay how's that going um i'd say the second thing is you know you many of you work with the legislature and a lot of people are like oh it's going to be tough for you over there you know with the legislature i gotta tell you i'm enjoying every single minute over there in that legislature i'm loving you know, my issues are in direct, you know, sort of, I'm able to be able to work on both sides of the aisle to move forward the priorities we have specifically in the issues of forest health and wildfire management. I'm not certain that, and recreation, I'm not certain that we're gonna get everything we want because obviously it's a really tough time budget-wise with McCleary and everything, but very receptive uh, from all the legislatures across the state on a number of the items we're putting forward, so. Okay, I'm headed to Spokane, second time this week. Thank you, guys. Thank you, thank you. I look forward to coming back. I look forward to partnering with you. So.